start recording. Well, good morning, Lemon Grove clergy group and friends. So glad to good have morning. you this morning. May, can you believe it? We're in the middle of May. Happy birthday, happy birthday. Well, birthday to Joyce. Um, happy Mother's Day to all you mothers out there. Thank and, you. Um, so glad to have you this morning. We're going to start off by sharing and we're going to open with prayer. We're going to just share who we are, who we're with real quick. And then let me know if you have an announcement later and I'll wrap back around to you. And if you have any prayer requests, let us know. Um, before we start recording, Joyce asked about Pastor Jeff from the First Baptist Church. And as most of you know, he is um, battling pancreatic cancer, stage 2B, I believe. And um, he started chemo. He was able to start chemo. And, you know, that's just a long process, six months of chemo and then surgery to remove it. And then six more months of chemo. So if he's not on this morning to share anymore, just keep him in your prayers. We'll definitely do that. And um, before, we sh before we go to um, sharing of who we are in our organization, I, I read across this quote this week and I thought it was really awesome. It reminded me of all of you says, what makes a good community leader? Uh, they must possess empathy, the ability to inspire strong communication skills and pride in their community. Effective leaders are problem solvers who involve all members of their teams. They get people to work together toward a common goal and they focus on building effectiveness, the ability to get things done. It just made me think of all of you. And the reason that you're here today, I know is because you care about uh, our city and you wanna get things done and um, you're movers and shakers. And I'm so grateful to have you here today. Um, so let's just go around and share. And then after we finish sharing, um, well, actually let's open with prayer first and then we'll go around and share our name, our organization, if you have an announcement and any prayer requests. So um, let's see, is there anybody here who wouldn't mind opening with prayer? Who did you any, say? Any, um, any, or, what's that? I'm sorry. You were, you broke you up there for a second. Oh, I was just asking if there's anybody here who wouldn't mind just doing an opening blessing over our time this morning that what needs to be covered will be covered. And I can do that. I don't have any volunteers. Okay. Thanks, David. Let's just take a deep breath. And be present. We're thankful for this meeting and thankful for the opportunity to share, to honor the work that's happening in Lemon Grove, to honor the spiritual and the temporal, to honor each other, to look forward to the work that we do in hope in peace and in love. Thank you to all to whom we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, David. And David is going to be presenting a little bit later, so I'm looking forward to that. So on my screen, um, I have Joyce um, first up. So Joyce, if you want to unmute and share uh, who you are, who you represent, and let me know if you have any announcements. Uh, I am Joyce Moore, and I am a 30-plus uh, resident of Lemon Grove, and I am the president of Thrive Lemon Grove, and um, I am a community organizer, and I do just have an update that I want to share about an event that was went very, very well in Lemon Grove over the last two weeks. Great. We love great, um, great reports. Um, okay, so next I have David. Sorry, I was multitasking here. <laughs> uh, David Shorey, uh, Program Manager for the East Region for the Institute for Public Strategies. And uh, I do have announcements. Great. We'll, um, can we lump those announcements in right before your presentation? Would that work? Yeah, and actually Dean's going to do the presentation, but um, we'll, oh, we'll tag okay. team. Great. Okay, great. 
All right, perfect. Okay, and uh, Monique, good morning to you. I'm Monique Myers. I'm a community partnership prosecutor at the San Diego District Attorney's Office. I do have announcements and a request to go right after Joyce because I think I know what she's going to talk about and I'd like to piggyback on what she's talking Perfect. about. And if she doesn't talk about what I think she's gonna talk about, then, then I'll talk about it. You're speaking in code. <laughs> That's great. Okay. I was not trying to make the announcement now, so I'm trying to <laughs> the, give it for later. Right, right. That's awesome. Okay, Dean. Oh, you're muted. Trying to find the unmute button. There yeah. you go. The space bar is supposed to unmute you unless you really want it to, and then it doesn't. Sometimes Good morning, Dean does. Ambrosini, Institute for Public Strategies, and my announcements will be encompassed in my presentation. Perfect. Thanks, Dean. All right. Good morning, Roberta. You're next on my screen. Okay, hi. Uh, my name is Roberta Bulling. I'm a member of the Baha'i Faith Community, and I'm also a member of the Lemon Grove Historical Society. And I do have announcements for later. Wonderful. Thank you. Good morning, Billy. It looks like you're enjoying the morning on the beach there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm actually in Virginia right now. Um, is that right? But, oh. Yeah. Um, Billy Simmons, in. North Park Apostolic Church. Um, I have a praise report. I w went for a mammogram and they uh, told me they found some masses in both breasts. And so I had biopsies um, done last Thursday. And my doctor called me last night and said that none of them are, um, that they're all benign. Oh, so um, I am thankful for that. And the reason why I'm in Virginia is to visit my daughter and her family, but also to receive my uh, master's degree in pastoral counseling. Well, congratulations. But I would love to be on the beach too. Yeah, right. <laughs> oh, that's great. Congrats. How long did it take you to, to get your master's? A year and a half. Year and a half. Good job. That's good. Excellent. Well, thanks for, for being with us and enjoy your family time. All right, um, the Hidalgo, I forgot. What was your first name? Vivian. Vivian, name, that's right. Okay. Vivian Hidalgo, I am a graduate student worker for the County of San Diego, working alongside the health promotion team for North, and Cent uh, North Central and East regions. And I have no announcements. Okay, thanks for joining us. All right. Shanna? Hi, I'm Shannon Clevenger, and I'm the Crime Prevention Specialist with the San Diego County Sheriff's Department here in Lemon Grove. And I have a brief announcement. Oh, you do? Okay, great. Jennifer. Hello, Jennifer. Hi, this is Jennifer Mendoza. Um, I'm a member of uh, the St. John of the Cross uh, community. And um, also a uh, Lemon Grove City Council member. And then I just have a um, brief announcement about our next food distribution. Um, if anyone can help with that. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, uh, Kaylee, good to have you on this morning. Can you all hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, perfect. I was having major audio issues yesterday, so glad to see that that is not continuing. Um, but yeah, Kaylee Cantor, I am the program specialist from Mothers Against Drunk Driving in San Diego, and I do not have any updates to share with you guys today, but happy to be here. Great to have you. D-E-D-I-S-O-N. D uh, hi, good morning. Yeah, that was close. Uh, Dave Edison. Um, Dave. Uh, from the, yeah, uh, from the uh, County of San Diego Behavioral Health Services. Uh, good morning, everybody, and I have no announcements for today. Great. Good to have you, Dave. Thank you. And Farah, or Farah, I think is how you say it, Farah? Yes, it's Farah. Oh, Farah. Uh, I was right the first time. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Good morning. My name is Farah. I'm from Nile Sisters Development Initiative, and I work on their Full Stop program, which is families uniting locally to solve tobacco proliferation. Um, I have a very quick announcement. Okay. Great. Thanks, Farah. And Lydia. Good morning. 
Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Lydia Romero, I'm the city manager for the city of Lemon Grove, and I have just one short announcement to make. Um, I do have a 10 o'clock meeting, so um, if I could just jump the line, that would be great. You got it. No problem. It'll be just a, just one more introduction and then we'll move to you. So I think that might be Susan Farnsworth, the last person on my screen. Is that you, Susan? Susan Farnsworth, Lemon Grove United Methodist Church. And I don't have any announcements or. Uh... Okay. Great to have you, Susan. Thank you. All right. Well, I think that does our, oh, I'm, I'm Ann Stapleton um, from Lemon Grove uh, Clergy Association and also Cornerstone Community Church of Lemon Grove. And my husband is now employed by Home Depot. So he's no, he was at the USPS for five months and then off for uh, like a month and a half. And I put him to work, <laughs> did all kinds of jobs, took him up to my dad's to help my dad install air conditioner and all kinds of stuff. And then he just started this week in Santee. And the ultimate goal is hopefully to get him transferred to Lemon Grove so he can work in the community that we we love to live in, work and play and eat and minister. And so that's our, our ultimate goal is that he can be uh, in Lemon Grove and get our benefits covered so our church doesn't have to cover it. That's a big expense for our little church. So um, he is on his third day at Home Depot. So he sends mm -hmm. his greetings. Okay, I'm going to go to Lydia and let her go ahead and give uh, your announcements, Lydia, and then we'll um, stop at the, start at the top and do Joyce and then Monique. Thank you so much. And thanks everybody to let me jump the line. I just do two quick, one quick announcement is it looks like um, there's a high probability, like 99.9% .9 that we will be having our in first in-person city council meeting in over 13 months. And that will be the upcoming city council meeting on May 18th. Hey. Um, we will have safety measures in place and those will be listed on the agenda. But um, uh, for anybody that would like to attend, the most mandatory thing is making sure that they make it wear a face covering of some sort um, so we can uh, keep everybody safe, safe. And according to the county, we're using the very similar guidelines for the opening of uh, uh, churches so that's what we'll be we'll be targeting and then um and then look to our website or a, an announcement from um uh, from the city on us going back to renting out the park space to, to residents to hold birthday parties um and and other uh, of, other of our venues and then if all of you can pass on to your congregations or to your friends and family there is a free walk-up vaccination clinic it moved from the community center so we could go back in person for the city council meeting to the senior center uh, there uh, uh, i can't recall the hours but it's up on the county website um, and it's a walk-in clinic anybody can go in i think it's 16 and up to to get a free vaccination and those are all of my announcements i'd be happy to answer questions if anybody had any so the city council meeting, will, will it be only in person or will you be doing like a hybrid model where other people can listen in who don't feel comfortable meeting in public? Unfortunately, we were working in a chambers that was built sometime in the dark ages. And so we don't, we don't even have telephone um, capability in the council chambers to do anything yet. So, um, and our computer system is, um, um, very old that does not have the capability of allowing us to, to stream so it'll be just in person we will allow those folks that do feel uncomfortable that they can still submit comments written comments and we'll take those written comments and then read them publicly um, so we're making that that provision yeah we looked at trying to upgrade the council chambers and it's at this point it's, it's just too expensive to having to rip out we would literally have to rip out the entire um, uh, IT system and put in a brand new system to make it work. Oh yeah, that be uh, because of the sound. Yeah, because of the sound system, because it's an integrated sound system, and so we'd have to integrate a sound system with some sort of uh, uh, video device that we don't have. So, 
Um, that's going to be on the docket. I know I've, I've spoken to uh, at least the mayor about perhaps making that a project in the future. Um, and um, so she's she's put me on a quest to find funding on that before we start having some serious discussions. Wow. Okay. Does does anybody have any questions for Lydia or it could be about what she talked about or something else? No questions? Uh, yes, I would just um, want to share along with what she shared about the the vaccination site. I worked that last week. So it's 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 walk ups are good, but it's real important that people make appointments because the way it works is um, the appointments are first and they go by the dosage. So each day they have so many dosage of the vaccine to give for the walk in, walk ups. So um, appointments is the best way to go and hope you get um, an, um, a walk up, have uh, some available. And I have to say that that particular site is very busy, very mm. busy. Because I give um, a community health worker. So what we do, we assist in giving um, packets and then uh, we can make appointments. And um, in our 45 minutes, I had given out all of my packets mm -hmm. and I had 50. And so they were all gone. Okay, that's good, good information. Yeah, the appointments are, sometimes they're tricky <laughs> to find the, the appointment at the place where you want, but if you just keep trying, you can usually get in. Um, okay, um, Lydia, I noticed that Conrad's Mortuary had a, a for sale sign on it. Is what happened to, is, are we losing our mortuary in Lemon Grove? Do you know? That particular mortuary closed down and we were never given a reason why they shut down. Um, so yes, it, it shut down. Um, uh, and, and I can't tell you that that, that particular um, business was doing um, uh, a robust business during coronavirus, not to be morbid. Right. But, uh, so I, I don't know whether they decided just to close that, that particular site down or the folks that were running it decided to walk away. We do wow. have one other mortuary in town, and the name escapes me, but they're on, um, uh, I believe they're on, not Harris Street, the street just over, but it might be West, um, that they're located at. But yes, um, yes, they left, and wow. we, we still don't know why. That's interesting. They've been yeah, around I for know, a long time. I'm going to add a little bit to that, Anne. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I know Donna Conrad, and... Um, she, uh, she, she retired, you know, at, she was eight, like almost 80 years old and her, and her son was running the business with her and, but he was, he was 60. So he retired also, you know, he was old enough to retire also. May I help you? So, um, so anyway, they retired and they sold the business, um, to, uh, uh Dignity Partners and um, which is kind of a big like conglomerate of um, mortuaries. And then for whatever reason, uh, Dignity is, you know, but the Conrads never, um, never owned the, the property. They, they okay. always rent, rented the property. Oh, so wow. okay. I don't know um, why Dignity decided to, to move, it. but um, that's kind of what happened there. And then I noticed there was a sign um, where the international market used to be. Is the is the pet hospital going through? Because I remember that was on the docket for a while. Yes, um, I, uh, I saw think the he was waiting. Yes, I think he was waiting for some financing and some other uh, internal stuff to do. So he's moving forward with that project, and and hopefully he's got his all his building permits and everything he needs to go uh, to go forward with. So hopefully he'll he'll be they'll be starting construction fairly shortly. Which will oh, be nice exciting. to have that amenity there. Yes. 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 That, that's going to be great. Get rid of some of the. Oh, I had a question, Anne. Yes. For Olivia, uh, um, is Barry's uh, Athletics going to be still located in Lemon Grove? So yes. So Barry's um, just relocated um, to a new space that's right across from Lemon Grove Cafe. Uh, I think that's North Avenue. Um, and. Um, uh, uh, 
they are actually doing their move-in date this week and they should be open for business, walk-up business and retail, uh, online business. Uh, <coughs> talking to John, he, he was anticipating early next week. Wow. Uh, Thank yeah. you. Yes. A lot of things moving, a lot of things on the move. And I have a question for Lydia too, please. Okay. Uh, Lydia, uh, do you have any information on the and the Anna's restaurant building? I see they are doing some construction there. Do you know who's coming there? No, um, we we haven't seen anything. I have to go back and take a look at the building permit. I know we've been um, sharing that with other restaurant tours, so we could bring some kind of a family a family restaurant in town. Um, so I, I'll I'll check on that, Joyce, and get back to you. Thank you. Yeah, the word on Nextdoor app, uh, the Nextdoor app, is that it's a pizzeria, but I, I don't know if that's accurate. Okay, so well, I'll, we'll double check and see. Usually, be, because it's if it's a like, a like business, um, all they really need to do is come in, um, get a business license, and if they're doing small uh, tenant improvements, as long as they don't go over a particular threshold, um, they don't need to let us know about it. Oh, cool. Yeah. Great. Well, it's good to see things moving and it's exciting to see the development. Okay, so I'm gonna switch over to, um, unless anybody else, last call for Lydia. Um, thank you, Lydia, for taking time to be with us this morning. It's always great to have you here. So I'm gonna go to Joyce and she wants me to share a picture. I was able to open it up, Joyce, so, um, okay. So there's the picture that Joyce wants me to share. So go ahead, Joyce. So it may might not mean a much uh, a lot to everybody, but I'm just 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 over the moon, ecstatic, super happy about it because um, SD Knights we worked really hard to get them in Lemon Grove, and uh, they are here, and I think we are where we want to be and moving forward, and that partnership with Carl and. Uh, linebacker that is phenomenal so two weeks ago they had a paint me night and that was with parents and their kids and so they gave they were given a kit and the kit I wish I had got it out of my car because they gave me one but I wasn't able to participate but I got on and so the thing that really excites me and bless me is they had about 300 participants and Chris Walsh um text me uh, real early on. He said, Carl has over 164 parents on. And, you know, we've had some struggles over the last two years with, you know, just a little bit of everything. Um, and so just to see the district and the parents and the students uh, just get back to where it used to be was just really amazing. And it was heartwarming. I was so excited about it. And so I would say, you know, that there are so many great things that are happening. I know Roberta, myself, we both had, you know, our kids here and the district and the school, it was just a thriving, a thriving uh, place for families. And we're getting back to that. And uh, Carl said we had the most participant out of all of his uh, sites so far. And that's huge because some of those sites, most of those sites are very, very, very large. So they gave out, and he's going to give this report today uh, at the Glenwood Grove Collaborative. He said they gave out 900 kits, which is really, really good. I showed this one because this was the mayor's, and uh, she they asked her to do, uh, you know, just do a greeting, and she came on and she greeted, and she stayed on and she participated. So this is her picture, oh, and she she's really that. proud of it. Yeah, this is hers, <laughs> and she's really proud of it. So you, if you go to her office, you're probably going to see it. And That's I was great. just really, really. Um, grateful uh, because she had to move some things around to, you know, come in and participate in what she always does, Lemon Grove first. And so I just wanted to share those two things and I'm really, really excited. So when you guys get the flyers from SD Night, I usually send everything out. If you could just help me by continuing to uh, help put the word out, I would greatly appreciate it. And also, because I am a community health worker, I work many sites. So I'm all over San Diego County. So if you do need an appointment, uh, you can't call me or text me. Um, and if you text me while I'm at a site, 
Or if I, what I can start doing, if I'm at a site and I know they have extra vaccines, then I'll just send that out to Anne. If she has time to send it out, that would be great. So you can just come on over and um, get your vaccine, but appointments is still the best way to go. And we need to get more San Diegans vaccinated because everything is opening up and this is not a safe time. It might seem like it's a safe time, but it's a very, very, very important time for us to really continue to uh, practice the CDC guidelines. So we don't wanna be going back and forth, opening it up and then closing back down. And so um, with the safety guidelines and people getting vaccinated, that's why we're where we are now. And it has taken us a long time to get here. And I know I'm ready to get out. I'm gonna be traveling at the end of the month to celebrate my mother-in-law's 88th birthday. And uh, I want everybody that's traveling with me to be safe. I'm gonna be safe, but I want them to be safe as well. So that's what I have. And thank you so very much, Anne, for all you guys continue to do. And thank all of you for just your wonderful work that you do for our city. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you, Joyce, very much. And um, I think Monique wanted to follow Joyce is that correct? Yes, I did. And Dean, the space bar thing did not work for me. I just tried it as well because I thought it was the most it, really it thing. It didn't work for me. Not alone. Yeah. If um, you, Alt A, Alt A will is a, a sure toggle. Yeah, for your mic. I like how it's been over a year and I'm still figuring out the tips and tricks <laughs> of how to do it. Thank you. Um, I did want to go after Joyce because um, I happened to be on the phone with Carl McCullough in the Lemon Grove Kate night and I heard all about how awesome it was. Um, and I wanted to share that Carl, I think, I think I've told you, I'm not sure if it was Lemon Grove Collaborative or here, it kind of, it's all blurring together. Um, but Carl and I have worked together for the past two years on putting on crime prevention presentations or events with law enforcement and students working together. And we've done it where it's like a crime prevention presentation before the fun activity um, or a joint activity for youth and law enforcement and district like an escape room or a murder mystery or something like that. Um, and I wanted to just put that out there if that's something that would be of interest to the community of Lemon Grove um, I'm happy to work with Carl on doing that kind of thing. It's a great way to get information to people at their homes, right, directly, and then they can ask questions or to engage in law enforcement in a different way than how they might otherwise engage with them to just start rebuilding some of those relationships. Um, I wanted to share with you uh, a report. It's a really heavy report. It's 108 pages, so I'm sure you're going to print it and tab it and highlight it and by this document, um, but it, it is truly a, a really great overview of what the district attorney's office has been doing, and it highlights a bunch of new programs. Hopefully none of these are ragingly new to you because I've been attending these meetings and I've been telling you about them, but it's a really great resource of seeing some of the things that are happening in the community that are not what you expect maybe from what we've been doing. So I'll put that in the chat. It's fresh off the presses. Um, like I said, it, it's a hefty report, but it really goes into depth of the work that we're doing. And it might trick, trick, uh, trigger something in your mind of different ways that we could also work together. There is an executive summary, uh, so you can check that out. Um, but that might be of interest. And then the last thing, it's, it's not really my update, but I wasn't sure if someone else was gonna talk about it. And I feel like I'd be remiss if I didn't, although this is not a DA thing. Um, and maybe it's something that Vivian or Joyce would want to talk about, but it's my understanding, so correct me if I'm wrong, that the county last week announced that organizations can host mobile vaccination clinics now if they believe that 100 people can attend. So they are hoping to that be able to like get to where the people are by having mobile vaccination clinics and it can be organized. So you could do it with a group of churches, for example, if, if your church doesn't believe you could get the right numbers, but a group could come together uh, and I think this will be particularly significant in light of the fact that Pfizer was just preliminarily approved enough. It still has to be approved by the CDC in California and San Diego. Um, but I was at a meeting yesterday and someone from the county was saying it's very possible that next week, the by Thursday or so, it will be available to 12 year olds and up. And so that will be a very, very big increase in the number of people that would be eligible. And based on what Joyce was saying about how appointments are really necessary because 
um, it's a very busy site that might be of some interest to you to explore that idea of maybe doing it at your church parking lot or whatever you work with the county on on how it works but that might be something that would be helpful for people because they're already used to going to your church right they already have figured out how to get transportation to your church and so that might be something to explore i just wanted to put that out into the universe to uh, make sure that it was well known thank you so if somebody if a church was wanting to do something like that who would they contact vivian do you know from health and human services because it's through you guys I'm sorry, I was answering an email. What was it? Um, I was talking about the mobile vaccination clinics that the county just announced are possible. Oh, to host a vaccination site? Yeah, could you share, if a church is interested is it, in doing that, could you provide- Of course, let me send the link. Of how they can sign up, get that process started. Oh, great, yes, here you go. Super. She's going to post the link in the chat room. So if anybody here is interested, even in a couple churches going in together to do it, something like that. Great. You're welcome. Thank I also you, posted a video uh, to learn more about it. Oh, good. Oh, good. Excellent. Okay. Anything else, Monique, or are you good? That was, and thank I you forgot so much one thing. For all you I'm, do. Sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. Go and ahead. I'm going to send this to you. So uh, Multicultural Health, they got some extra funding from uh, San Diego Foundation. So we are able to provide assistance with food and transportation uh, for homebound, those who are homebound. And I'm gonna send the action to be out in the community shortly here, uh, passing these out to different agencies, organizations, wherever they let me post it. I don't know if you guys can see it, probably not because of my background, but yeah. And so the information is on here and I'm going to scan it in and I'm gonna send it to you. If you can send it out, that would be great. And so I'm really working with uh, Citronica, uh, the, both of the Citronicas, because especially um, the seniors, and they said that they do have people that are homebound. There is help, there's resources. So I'm happy to share this and hopefully we'll uh, take advantage of it. That's awesome. That's great. Thank you, Joyce. Okay, next up, David, do you wanna go ahead and share? Good morning again, everyone. So I wanted to um, announce, um, and I know Joyce has sent this out, I believe um, folks may have seen it, that on um, May the uh, 25th, uh, IPS is, host, is doing a Speak Well training uh, sponsored by the Lemon Grove Collaborative and uh, the Lemon Grove, uh, Thrive Lemon Grove. Um, I'm going to put a, a um, um, link to the um, um, the the uh, well, maybe I'm not going to put it. I'll put a link to the flyer in there, but also put the link to register for it. And basically, um, it is. Um, no, that's not going to work either. Okay, um, I'll get it in there. <laughs> I'm having technical difficulties. Um, Speak Well training is an opportunity for you to um, learn how to get your message across to elected officials, to the media, uh, to decision makers. Um, this one is focused around um, talking about drug and alcohol policy. Um, I did post on a Lemon Grove Facebook page and there was already a comment about um, uh, so you're organizing people to speak out against um, the legal marijuana dispensaries. Um, this is about talking about uh, issues of drugs and alcohol. Um, we know that that uh, even um, uh, you know alcohol licenses that are legal have an impact on communities, and we want to be able to work with communities and have community members talk about those impacts and how they can be mitigated to the best possible way. And so that's what this the purpose of this Speak Well training is. I know that some of you have participated in, in the past. Um, so it's May 25th. It's from uh, 6 uh, to 8 p.m. and um, it's free. And so if um, you'd like more information, like I said, I'll post um, a link to the uh, registration in the chat, as well as uh, an image of the uh, flyer that you can share with your um, congregants and, um, 
and friends, family, and community. Great. That open, David, is that open to everyone or just Lemon Grove people? It's open to everyone. I mean, it's going to be Lemon Grove specific, but it the skill set that you learn it is, can be used anywhere. So, and if there's interest in us doing other ones, like if you know Monique of a, a community or organization that might want to participate in something like that, let me know. We can definitely set one up for them as well. Great. Thank you, David. That's great training. Um, before I go on to the next announcement, I want to welcome Hariel. Hi, and Sarah. I think you popped on maybe after we did announcements or somehow I skipped you. So, um, Hariel, do you want to introduce yourself and say what agency or what you're representing? And same for you after Sarah will be after you. Hi, everyone. Good to see you again. Uh, you know, uh, well, I mean, COVID still going on, but, uh, you know, it'd be great to meet again in person. Uh, my name is Hariel Corsair. Uh, my wife and I, um, we work with uh, some of the agencies that are on um, on the call today, like Thrive Lemon Grove, uh, uh, and and grant, grant supporter of the clergy association. Um, we provide entertainment. We provide art, music, dance, culture in the community. Um, and we're also advocates of financial literacy. And we're going out and, and talking to people, spreading the words, helping them out, especially we've seen such an increase in these times due to COVID with people worried about their, their health insurance, people worried about their, their retirements, people worried about their investments. And, um, and we sit down and we, we educate people on what's out there, especially with some of the uh, changes as well with tax laws, tax code, um, and also some of the stimulus uh, plans that have been put in place. So there's a lot of questions to be had out there. And, uh, and my wife and I work with a great team. We're a great resource as well for um, any information that uh, for anything financial, whether it be from homeowners insurance to debt consolidation and everything in between. So um, so especially during these rough times, uh, I, I reach out, please reach out, let's sit down, let's have a conversation. Let's see where you are now and, and, and where you wanna be in the future. And let's make sure to take advantage of uh, everything that's out there to, to help us get there, all right? And so um, it's been great, you know, this is, I, I can't believe I've missed so many months of, of, of the call, uh, but we always enjoyed being in person. And uh, we have had some family medical emergencies and things of that nature as well, that has kind of had us preoccupied, but uh, good to be back engaged and, and looking forward to being here again, supporting the church community and supporting the neighborhood. Great to have you, Harriel. Tell your wife hello from us. Okay, will do. Sarah, do you want to introduce yourself real quick? And then we'll go sure. over to Roberta after that. Yeah, sorry, I popped on a little late. Um, I'm Sarah Lewis from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Um, I actually work with young women. I'm planning a young women's camp for our small group of girls this summer, which I'm excited about. We have actually a fundraising carnival coming up on the 22nd of May at our church to get the girls some funds for their camp. Um, we're doing outdoor venue, keep it safe and keep it outdoors. Um, also, I am working with Historical Society. I'm actually in charge of their email newsletter. If anyone's interested in interesting, interesting tidbits of history, I send out an email once or twice a month. Um, I can add you to my email list. Um, we're planning a big thing in October and I'll give you more information on that as it comes. I just wanna give a shout out to the vaccination clinic in Lemon Grove. I love that it's here. I took my 16 year old to get vaccinated as soon as she could be vaccinated. It was easy to walk up. She was able to get a, a dose because he went early in the day. Um, I know on Thursday you can make appointments for 12 to 15 year olds. Um, my 18 year old got vaccinated um, and he only has one shot and he was exposed to COVID through coworkers, but he tested negative. Um, so I'm so glad, I'm just so glad I got him vaccinated as soon as he could. I just, I really want to plug for just, even if it just keeps us from having to quarantine for 14 days, it's, it's worth the effort to get vaccinated. So thank you. Great. Great, Sarah. That's the good news. And uh, speaking of historical society, Roberta, you're up next with your two announcements. I think you said you had two and you're muted. 
I'm glad Sarah came on because she gave you the uh, update from the Historical Society. Our, our gala is going to be Saturday, uh, October 9th. We're having a, we're going to be unveiling the, the new name of the park. Civic Center Park is now Traganza Heritage Park. So we're inviting the whole community. It's going to be a great morning. We're going to have an open house of museums in the afternoon and um, and in the evening we're having a, you know, a, a dinner that you can buy a ticket for and so on and so on. Share our archives. It, it's going to be a great, wonderful day if, if we stay open, of course. And, and, and uh, Joyce uh, spoke to that, uh, that we, need, we still need to be careful right now so that we don't have to close down again. We hope that doesn't happen. And the Baha'i community, the announcement we have is that on we're holding our third annual Race Amity, Race Amity Day celebration in Lemon Grove. We've asked the mayor to speak. We've, uh, we're lining up speakers that are going to be talking about their experience, working with people of other backgrounds and doing things in the community that are uniting. So uh, we're very much looking forward to that. We have to do a webinar style again this year, but we're hoping next year we'll have a picnic in an open space where we can have everybody come and share uh, together. What date is that? That's uh, going to be, it's always the second Sunday in June. And our webinar is going to start at three. It'll be about a 90 minute program this year because everybody's tired of Zoom. Last year we did a three hour one, but <laughs> we think that an hour and a half is plenty of time this year. <laughs> Great, excellent. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Roberta. So, um, um, we'll have flyers and we'll get the word out. Michael, okay. I just send a, uh, send a flyer and we, we can disseminate it to everyone. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Shanna, you're up next if you are available. She's got her camera off, but maybe she has I it. I am. Give me one second. Here we go. <laughs> okay. Hi guys, um, just a couple things I wanted um, Roberta to know that I have done three neighborhood watch meetings recently and they all went really well. Um, one of them got a little chilly because we were outside, but for the most part, everybody was comfortable and able to sit, you know, a safe distance apart. So if anyone is interested in a neighborhood watch meeting um, or you know somebody that is, please pass that information along. I'll put my information um, in the chat so that you can get a hold of me. Um, also, God willing, as, as long as nothing changes and we continue this um, upward movement with the COVID situation, um, I look forward to August 3rd being National Night Out this year and doing it um, the proper way. Um, I would like to uh, get some input, especially from Harry Ol. Um, he was going to help me last year and Unfortunately, we didn't have the, the show that we wanted to, but um, quite a few of you have um, great resources that if you wanted to participate, bring a table set up, um, definitely I will be reaching out to you um, for resources for that evening. Um, and when Joyce was mentioning Citronica earlier and the, um, the elderly residents, um, I wanna make sure Joyce, um, I give you this information and you can pass it along, but you know about our YANA program with the Sheriff's Department. So um, that would be a great resource for YANA as well. Excuse you, Mike. Uh, I'm talking. <laughs> um, sorry, my Lieutenant just walked in. Um, so YANA would be a great um, program for them, um, whether they want an in-person visit or just someone to call them daily and check on them. Um, definitely a free resource that we would love to provide for them. That's awesome. That's this great. Is, is underplaying Yana because Yana is an amazing program. And I think everyone who's elderly who lives alone should be enrolled in the Yana program because it's really really amazing and if you don't know what it is they basically check on law enforcement calls you and checks on you every single day and make sure that you're okay um and if you don't pick up your phone they call your emergency contact um if that's how it's requested and then they show up at your house and make sure that you're okay and so it's, it's a really really amazing program if you're elderly and you're living alone um and they provide socialization as well as just 
um, safety, right? Like if there's an issue that's going on, that kind of thing, it's Monday through Friday. It's a really, really amazing program. Um, that that's great. I, I've been really impressed by it. So I'm, I don't work for the sheriff's department, but I think it's really amazing. That's, that's a great program. I'm going to look and see if they have that where my dad lives. That would be great just to have that extra yes, help, it's, you know? It's helped a lot. Or, you know, unfortunately, a lot of elderly people um, don't live near other family members or their children live out of state and they right. can't check on them. And it's just a reassuring to know that someone's going to check on them every day. We have, un, you know, found people that would have died had we not you know found them when we did they, they'd already been on the floor for a couple of hours but thank god we found them and yeah so it's wow. a great program that's great excellent so if if somebody wanted more information on that would they just go yeah to i'm gonna the... put i'm gonna put the number okay. um also um what you'll do is you'll call our uh senior volunteers and they're okay. the ones that set it up and i will put all that information in in the link as well Great. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Shanna. Um, Jennifer, you're up next. Um, hello. Hello. Um, hi. So I just wanted to uh, remind everybody that we're still doing the um, monthly food distribution. Uh, it's a joint effort of Thrive Lemon Grove, the Lemon Grove Lions, and the city. And we're picking up food on Friday and we'll be packing it Saturday night at the recreation center at 6 p.m. If anyone would like to come and help um, pack up the bags. And then on Saturday morning, we start setting up around 8 a.m. and distribute at 9. And I know some of some of you have already responded <laughs> that you're going to be there um, to help either on Friday night or Saturday. So um, I really appreciate it. And then pass the word, you know, to anyone in your congregations or within your circle of family or friends that is having, um, you know, any food insecurity because, you know, we give out some nice, nice bags of food. So um, I just wanted to say that. And then um, I also just wanted to add this week, um, our, our church has been meeting inside for uh, weekday masses for like the last month or so. And, you know, it's just, I, I kind of liked being outdoors, but um, our Sunday masses have moved inside now. Um, but then there's just something kind of, you know, I'm, I'm a bit of a traditionalist too. And it's, it's nice to, you know, be able to move inside and have the organ playing and, um, so I'm kind of torn over which one I like, but, um, but anyway, it's been, it's been, uh, uh, you know, big, big changes going on everywhere. So. Great. Thank you, Jennifer. Good program. Um, okay. So uh, Farah, I think I've got you up next for the Nile sisters. Yes. Hello everyone. Um, I just have a quick announcement. I am looking to partner with a church or a faith-based organization in Lemon Grove um, to do a presentation on vape or marijuana or um, tobacco products or anything that you feel might be relevant to your congregation. Um, so I would ideally do a quick presentation during a sermon or during um, any type of event. So if anyone is interested in that, please let me know. I will put my contact information in the chat. And also, I just wanted to add, I think it's a good opportunity for if anyone has like a youth group, uh, because you know, there's issues with youth and vape. So that might be a good opportunity to have some education sessions for them. Great, if you put that in the chat room, I'll make sure to get that out. We don't have a ton of pastors on this morning, so um, I'll make sure to get that out. That is, That would be a great resource. Thank you. For youth groups, especially. Yes, perfect. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you. Um, wow. Is that all of our announcements? Oh, except for Dave. I mean, it's for Dean, of course. Um, okay, Dean, I think, unless there are any other announcements, we're going to let you make announcements and give us your presentation. I made you co host in case you need all to right. share your screen. Okay. So, yes. Um, there we go. And the presentation came up, correct? Yes. Good. Yes, we see it. 
always a relief. There we go. All right, um, just um, giving an update basically. I, well, a bit more of an in-depth update this time. Um, as you know from previous meetings that I've been in, um, our overdose data to action program is focusing on fentanyl and the impact that it's had. Um, we have some up-to-date data that I'm sharing and a new direction that we're taking the program. So I just wanted to get everybody acquainted with that. Uh, and, oh, well, this is our, our map of East County so that you see our, our REACH region there. Um, and then just moving directly ahead to uh, some fast facts about fentanyl. Um, basically, it's changed the focus of the opioid epidemic, which, uh, you know, occurred in, in, in um, different phases going from overprescription of uh, pain medication to illicit drugs when those were removed or when that problem was handled. And then fentanyl has made a dramatic rise um, in the last 10 years, but most specifically in the last three years, as you'll see from the figures coming up. And fentanyl, for those that don't know, is uh, a synthetic opioid, extremely potent. It's manufactured in China and it is imported through Mexico and it's making its way rapidly across the border. Very small amount, as you can see, that's actually a dot of fentanyl on a penny which at that blown up rate, you don't realize how, um, how small that is until you actually look at a penny. Uh, two micrograms can be fatal. And uh, fentanyl is often cut into and is actually more often lately cut into counterfeit prescription drugs that are sold on the streets. These are generally made with very poor quality um, by, you know, obviously they're counterfeit, so they're not looking for anything more than the return. And it is showing up presently in many street drugs, including cocaine and methamphetamine, which really doesn't make much sense. Um, the graph on my screen uh, basically shows the fentanyl deaths in San Diego County. As I said, it's been an emerging trend starting in 2000. Not a particularly difficult, you know, not a particularly um, heavy trend, but as you look over the last uh, four to five years, you'll see that it's seen an increase. Now, the ones that are um, in the earlier years could well have been for legitimate uses of fentanyl and accidental overdoses on those. These are all uh, believed to be uh, fatalities, according to the medical examiner's office. It was kind enough to provide me with these up-to-date slides. Um, these are the, the figures for actual uh, suspected, in most cases, uh, counterfeit fentanyl. And as you can see from 2017, Actually, to go from 16 to 17, 18, I mean, we've effectively doubled. Our figure was 152 in 2019. Uh, if you add 2020 to that, uh, you can see that there is a stark uh, difference. And the green bar shows uh, the finalized fentanyl cases. And um, according to the figures uh, given by the medical examiner's office, uh, 11 of those were still pending as of March 31st. Um, so you can see we more than doubled um, the overdose deaths due to fentanyl this year, which is really responsible for last year, which is responsible for the, the urgency that we're, um, we're putting to fighting this epidemic. And this is a breakdown that's really rather interesting because it does show... Um, you know, that there were some seasonal spikes, which, you know, obviously they really don't know exactly much about the supply and where it's coming from, but there was an alarming increase in August. It could have been due to many factors as well as in July. Um, those figures really don't correlate to anything right now, but um, it does tend to ebb and flow. But just to give you some statistics on that, of the 400, 457 total preliminary and then confirmed cases, we are showing that 351 of those were male at 77% and female 23%, the average age 37 years old. And the age range, which I think is alarming, is from 14 to 76 years old. So we do show that that is a very broad um, range, but we certainly need to start getting the message out to youth because the overdose rate being that low um, does create a sense of uh, alarm to start getting that message out. And then this does show that breakdown um, with the age ranges. 
with teens, there were 19 overdoses, which, you know, that may seem in compared to the others, it may not seem that severe, but when you consider that 19 uh, kids under the age of 20 that have overdosed on fentanyl, it is uh, definitely worth, it's noteworthy. Um, this is just a comparison uh, for statistical purposes from 2019 uh, to 2020. 305 more fentanyl deaths than in 2019, and this number could change as the cases are closed. Um, but, you know, the, the demographic shifted a little bit. Um, we're now finding that there are more male than in pre or there were there are more female overdoses than there were in previous years, which if you're a statistics free like me, you always ask uh, questions like, well, why is that happening? Um, so here's the basic breakdown is that the fentanyl deaths increased 200% from 2019 to 2020, which is on target for what I previously had been told to expect. Um, and the female uh, fentanyl deaths, just to show that, you know, we're starting to adapt, establish some trends, increased 458%, 164% for male. I think this graph is really the most alarming of the ones that were shared with me. If you look at the first, this one includes a preliminary data, and it is largely preliminary, but it is suspected that the red bars will eventually be confirmed. They're not confirmed as yet. Um, if you look at the early months of uh, 2020, which are over here, you'll see that we had 75 cases. And if you look at the early months of 2021, uh, you'll see that we already have 147 specific case or suspected cases as of the 13th of March. So March isn't even a complete month and it's already showing 37. So if this trend continues, we, we may well double the figures again this year. So it is really important to increase the messaging and get that message out to everyone. Absolutely everyone needs to know. Um, and, you know, IPS does that. Uh, we work with equity-based solutions. We use what's called an upstream approach. We try to address the, the um, causes behind the cause and, or, well, the factors behind the cause, I guess is better to say. And, you know, we try to address the factors which contribute to opioid use in, address, in addition to doing direct outreach as we are with the Overdose Status Action Project. But, um, we try to work with the social determinants, as I said, those would be the cultural and racial inequities, the socioeconomic factors, and of course, the barriers to treatment. And, you know, the cultural barriers do show that communities of color face greater challenges in meeting the epidemic, despite the significant impact. Um, let me see if I can minimize so that I can see my graph there. There we go. Um, if you look at the, um, the, the demographic graph on the side, you'll see that there is a significant um, opioid use problem, a synthetic opioid use problem in the black non Hispanic communities and the American Indian Alaska Native uh, communities. Well, it is across the board, of course, but we do show that there are some definite uh, racial and cultural uh, inequities, and that could be lack of culturally responsive and respectful treatment and care and separate and unequal prevention efforts. And we are working to mitigate that by getting our messaging out in a variety of languages. We currently have our fentanyl message out, which we translated into Farsi and Arabic. And we are making inroads and working with the reservation system to get the message out to them as well in a culturally respect respectful way. Um, and then of course, there's also pre-existing and negative stereotypes of the different cultural groups. Uh, many of which I don't need to go into because it's so widely known that people tend to believe certain things about certain groups when it comes to drug use. Um, economic factors are, are a problem as well, especially now that we have COVID shaking out. Um, economic resources, resources, of course, we know influence health outcomes. Uh, te technology, is an access, as technology access is a barrier to prevention messaging. We're working with a low-tech solution to help reach the um, the lower income demographic so that we get that message out in a hard copy form that doesn't necessarily require an internet connection or even television for that matter. 
And then, of course, there's the lack of ad adequate health care, which creates a barrier to substance misuse treatment. And the unhoused population is particularly neglected in this case of messaging. All right. So, um, as I said, we're using, we are meeting the, uh, the barriers to help mitigate them through uh, an upstream solution where we're trying to reach uh, age, age, race, address the age, race, and cultural barriers, targeting lower income communities and breaking down barriers to treatment. So what I, as I said before, we are reaching out through low tech solutions using the printed materials. I said it's in a variety of languages so we can address that cultural barrier as well. And we're partnering with, partnering with resource, resource engagement points. Sorry, I've not had enough coffee this morning. We're, we're trying to get it out to places where uh, the unhoused population congregates, such as libraries, um, job distribution sites, food distribution sites, job training and workforce development sites, um, trying to have a lower tech option available there so that, you know, so that the cards can be stuck into a, a food distribution bag and they can be sitting there in the waiting room while someone is uh, waiting at the workforce uh, development agency for for service. And we're also working to increase awareness of substance use disorder treatment options. Um, we are working to increase the awareness of the effectiveness of medically assisted treatment, which is MAT, as a bridge to sustained recovery. Um, MAT is often viewed with some skepticism by people as swapping addictions. It is not. It is a very carefully um, formulated program to help promote sustained addiction while it helps to block the uh, the sensors in the brain that absorb the, the, well, that are affected by opioids. And we're also working to increase access to care, um, removing barriers to people see seeking care, and of course, to address stigma. Which of course is the biggest barrier to treatment because, you know, stigma affects many things. Many people might have heard me speak of it in other presentations, but you know, the stigma that we have around drug use um, is particularly useless right now. As I said, in cultural situations, people tend to assume certain things about different uh, social groups and their drug use. They tend to believe and have different perceptions and tend to marginalize people thinking that in certain cases, they're just predisposed to do that. And unfortunately, that doesn't just work within society. It also affects inst you know, institutional and structural stigma affects political will and funding for preventing and treating substance use disorders. And that shakes out to a lack of access to healthcare, lack of resources, and lack of outreach to the unhoused population, which is uh, extremely important at this point. Um, and it can also come out in law enforcement and just justice system where people in marginalized communities may be less likely in certain cases to be offered medically assisted treatment and less likely to be offered diversion programs such as drug court, which can be helpful bridges to sustained recovery, and in this case, they're life-saving because they lower the risk of fentanyl. Okay, so you know the thing with fentanyl is, is that it's really the lines in all of this to where everything we believe to be true, as I said, with the stigma is really no longer applicable. You know, these are just some fast facts that I pulled from various studies. Most fentanyl overdose victims did not knowingly purchase the drug. It's believed that it was, you know, as I said, it's being slipped into counterfeit pills, obviously to increase the strength, but it's being done in such a way that most people don't know how much they're getting, including the person that made the pill. Many overdose victims are first time recreational users, and this pertains particularly to youth. They're taking something that they think is, is similar to what they've seen in a medicine cabinet, and this can go with other people as well. It looks like what the doctor gave me for dental surgery, maybe it'll work. And unfortunately, it turns out to be laced with fentanyl. Recent Sandag study, study showed that 68% of adult arrestees would not purchase a drug knowing that it contains fentanyl. Um, and the counterfeit pills contain inconsistent, uh, inconsistent amounts of the drug and are believed to be responsible for many of the overdoses. Now, just to let you know, someone really brought that home. I believe it was a piece, police officer in a presentation that I saw that you just have, you, when you make that batch of cookies and you eat that one that has a big lump of sugar in it because you didn't mix very well, 
that's kind of what happens with the fentanyl. These people are not um, by any means uh, concerned with quality control and they don't pay attention when they're batching these things. And in addition to counterfeit pills, as I said, it's showing up with no rhyme or reason in co cocaine and methamphetamine. So um, it's really showing that it's time to start looking past the stigma and realize that this risk and this threat is everywhere and it can pertain to anyone. So, you know, we are, as I said, you know, we're meeting the racial and cultural barriers by using culturally appropriate messaging wherever possible and trying to reach people at their level. We're being aware of the impact of the war on drugs and the fact that that may have shut off certain demographics to hearing prevention messaging and we're crafting age-appropriate prevention messaging to teens. And that is a difficult thing because, you know, with, with kids, you have to be careful how you say it because sometimes, and I heard this put very well, sometimes it sounds like a consumer reports review where it's something that they may want to try. So we try to meet them at their level and we try to educate them without enticing or, uh, or sparking rebellion. We stress the seriousness of drug use without focusing on the, arrest, or on the effects, which is where they may, you know, think, wow, you know, we hear a serious problem and they think that, sound, that might sound like fun. And we take a realistic approach. You know, we've learned in, in years past that scare tactics don't work. And also being realistic when we meet them and being aware of the fact that experimenting is part of growing up. And it's, you know, the forbidden fruit is, is the one they're going to climb the tree to get. So, um, you know, we are also, our programs at ITS and throughout the prevention system also help in an upstream way to address uh, helping, raising stronger kids, you know, helping kids make better choices. Our youth engagement programs like ECYC and uh, other uh, similar programs that we have in the South Bay, they help to promote leadership and give students an opportunity to participate in community change. Uh, other programs such as uh, NAMI do the same to help them get the leadership skills. And then it's important to build that positive self-esteem, to encourage personal growth programs and to build a healthy self-image. Studies have shown that um, these, it, when these are all put into place, the, per, the young person is less likely to uh, to make a bad decision. So turning it to the community and all of you, um, kind of my ask slide, uh, what you can do to increase awareness is to help us increase awareness. Um, we do have uh, informational postcards available in a variety of languages. We have them in English and Spanish, uh, Tagalog, um, Farsi, and Arabic. And those are available to put into your reception areas at your churches and at various other facilities. Um, I will be glad to ship them to you and would really appreciate it if you could help get that message out. And it's also important as a community that we take substance use signs seriously. If you think someone is having a problem, this isn't the time to let them work it out on themselves, uh, by themselves. This is the time to reach out and make sure that they know where that resource is. And I think it's also important in you know in a, a congregation or in a church setting make sure that people know that those resources are there and maybe consider peer counseling resources and other other programs that can help people have an opportunity to talk about problems before substance use becomes a bigger problem and you know also help foster community growth through leadership programs and building youth leadership skills and sponsor outreach and treatment programs as well so those are just some of the things that the community at large can do, and we certainly appreciate help. As I said, it's important to get this message out there. Um, the urgency is increasing, as you've seen, from the trends that are expressed in the slides at an alarming rate, and it is important that we get it out there. Uh, these are my references. Uh, for those who are interested, I can provide the slides to Anne as well, and my contact information as well. Um, which I'm going to stop sharing, and there we go. So I do have one more announcement to pin on to the end. Um, bittersweet, but uh, semi-exciting news. This will be my last meeting with the collaboratives. 
uh, or with the uh, clergy association. I am staying with ITS, but I am moving to our LA office. I will be um, working on the West Hollywood project up there, which is a project that I've been a major fan of for a very long time. It's actually the project that introduced me to ITS. So I have absolutely enjoyed meeting with this group. Um, I wasn't sure what to expect when I came to a clergy association meeting, but I was pleased to see such a, uh, a broad-minded and dynamic group coming together to really affect change within the community, a variety of denominations, and everybody really working together. I think this is probably one of the best learning expenses, experiences that I've had uh, in East County, and I really do. Um, I will miss it a great deal. So, but yes, um, with that, are there any other questions uh, on the presentation? Thank you, Roberta. Jane. Um, Roberta, it looks like Roberta has a question. Yeah. So does David. Uh -huh. Dean, could you talk about that, that um, how you could be trained to have that one uh, substance that you give to the person? Yeah. yeah. Um, Narcan is an important resource to have, and it is available. Uh, IPS, of course, does not offer it um, directly, but we can help link you with the resource by using my contact information. And uh, Narcan is a drug that immediately reverses the effects of opioids. Um, it helps to knock, the, knock them off the sensor. I actually have a video that I use in pre presentations from time to time, but um, it's, it's, it shows exactly how Narcan works and it is easy to get, it is easy to use. It's becoming as important as a, you know, Basically, an EpiPen is to schools. It just needs to be in that first aid kit. You can get it um, through a website that I'll be glad to send along with the slides to Anne. And it is, it's, you know, there's no, there's no real requirement and the training is not difficult. You can watch a video on how to use it. And it's something you just want to have. It's, it's extremely important, especially in cases where someone may come in asking for help, you know, um, Churches often uh, have people outside, um, you know, waiting for compassionate people, and they may, in certain cases, be in need of that product. So, yes, I will be glad to provide that information to you. And it is, um, I mean, like I said, it's it's becoming a staple in the first aid kit. It's just is something you need to have. You don't want to have to use it, but when you need to use it, you want to have it there. It's as simple as, as, as using nasal spray. I think Billy was interested in that also. Um, and Billy, I did not ignore you. I just realized that the people never replied to me. I reached out to NAMI San Diego because you had asked me about Narcan backpacks. And I just looked mm -hmm. up, suddenly I was like, whatever happened with that? And I realized that they didn't respond. And so, um, Dean, could you share that? And if Billy, you're still interested, I, I apologize, but apparently my contact didn't work out. Um, Dean Absolutely. With her as well. Yeah, let me get the um, the bookmark up, and I can put the website in there. And uh, and then David, did you have a question called, for Dean as well? Well, he's he's putting that up on the chat room. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, you're uh, muted. So okay, there you go. Oh no, thank you. I'm. Uh, Dean, I had a, a, a question. You mentioned that uh, towards the end of your presentation that with youth comes experimentation and that's that's natural. And, and that, that goes probably for all of us sitting here. But I remember the stats um, earlier, it showed that um, there was only 19 use, fentanyl users among teens, but actually the mm -hmm. highest group, if my memory serves me correctly, was 30 to 39 years old. So I wonder if the other criteria are maybe that you mentioned and in, in, I don't expect you to go back and look at all those, but if there might be other criteria, maybe heavily weighted more than youth experimentation as it concerns fentanyl. Um, well, true. Um, for the most part, the the you know that is that is the norm, the median age range is the thirty to thirty seven, and the twenty to well, I think twenty to thirty five is the breakdown on that. I didn't go back. I can't go back to my slide right now. Um, that is the primary one. I think that what's of concern is that 
the fact that um you know 19 overdose deaths amongst among teens it doesn't seem like a lot when it's compared to the others but it's certainly significant that's 19 kids that aren't living to see adulthood and they're generally doing it as a, uh, you know as the result of one experiment we're not talking about bad kids in most cases that are you know hardcore drug users they don't always come from bad homes you know there have been cases in Encinitas there have been cases in the better parts of, of the South Bay in the nicer parts of East County you know this isn't just something that we can say well you know here's the reason there really isn't a reason the fact is is that they're trying something with the curiosity of a kid and like I said kids are going to experiment and I think we all know from our own youth we do um, and did but we want to make sure that they know those dangers without getting them curious enough to try the drug just to see how you know if, if he's right um, because it's very easy to have a fatality on your hands so I hope that answers your question no thank you thank you very much some of it is appearing in like Xanax and Ambien and things that they might, children might not perceive as scary because it's not heroin or methamphetamine. It's a pharmaceutical drug. And so mm -hmm. they feel safer about it. Dean and I have had many conversations about some of the difficulties in talking to students specifically mm. is um, Dean, you might say it best, but we've both heard from teenagers well, I don't know anyone who's had this problem. Mm -hmm. You might not, but it really just takes the one pill and then it's over, right? There isn't like a problem. It's not an addiction where you know someone who's going through a problem. That, that's not how this works. Um, and one of the things that students have said is they're told, to me, I was told, they get told about a lot of things being dangerous and then they're not that bad. And so, uh, you know, alcohol, for example, um, marijuana, they get told that this is like the end of the world, but they see how it doesn't appear to be that bad. And so now when we're saying, hey, fentanyl could kill you, they're like, well, is that really true? Because right. it might not be that bad. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's also, David, and, uh, yeah. just to follow up on, on what Dean and, and Monique said that, um, uh, you know, trying we, we re recognize that um you know it's in the 30 to 30 or 20 to 35 but we also realize that many of the all of those folks were 18 and under at one point <laughs> and so trying to instill some prevention in the youth um at an early age to keep that uh, eventual uh early adulthood um from changing we also know that um you know some of the the um Folks who are uh, engaging in, or who are using at the this uh, twenty to you know thirty five age range, um, are going to parties, um, and perhaps there might be eighteen, nineteen year old folks there as well. So um, mm -hmm. it's it's crossing over, and um, we're trying to engage, you know, having the eighteen and above conversation and the eighteen and below conversation. And it's, you know, like I said, right now, it's just, I mean, we can tell them don't experiment with drugs. We can tell them many things we have. I heard it. You know, my mother actually, for her master's thesis was writing a program that does what IPS does back in the 70s. And, you know, I mean, we, we kids were her guinea pigs. And I won't quite tell you how many times she regretted us having to be you know, it's like, you know, really, do you know what I do for a living kind of thing? Kids experiment, we do, we all did. But the thing is, it's so dangerous now. And I think that that danger really needs to be highlighted and it's difficult to do. It is a very difficult job. We're working, um, in my absence, Kate um, Santolina uh, will be doing some of the opioid work and she's very much, um, well, she's actually our, our ECYC coordinator. So she's uh, youth outreach is her specialty. So I'm hoping that she will bring some of that um, messaging directly to kids because it needs to get out there and even in youth groups in your churches. So, yeah. I think, I think Dean, uh, what you said, um, yeah. I, I think Dean, what you said was, was pretty telling um, that I never, no matter how you slice it, that's 19 kids are just not with us. But I also think what Monique said too, yeah. is that if they're not recognizing or it doesn't feel like this is a danger, you know, that they need to be aware of, 
um, mm -hmm. that can lead into what David's saying. Even if they make it past their teen in 20 years, you're still taken away from their adjustment as a young adult, you know, going forward. Because everybody, like you, like you said, David, everybody was a teenager at one point. We don't know if these 30 something year olds have always been 30 something year olds. So I appreciate all that. Thank you. That was good insight. I have a question, Dean. Language, kid, and just to, I'll go ahead. Yes. Mm -hmm. We're um, what are some of the symptoms um, for uh, the person going into, um, you know, actually, you know, overdosing? It's um, there's actually well outlined in the Narcan resource that I put in the um, uh, and I just realized I called you Roberta. I'm very sorry about that. I, <laughs> it's OK. <laughs> um, but in any case, um, in the in the uh, video that you'll see on the Narcan website, it does show how to recognize the signs. They generally um, any opioid depresses the breathing. Their breathing tends to become slow. Um, people often have a gurgling sound when they are breathing. They sound as if they're um, asthmatic, if you will, sort of a wheezing sound. Um, it's difficult for them to stay awake, not just that they're, you know, a little buzz looking. Um, this is like physically falling asleep, a lack of control in the, in the final stages without getting too graphic. There's also a loss of, of, of full bodily function. And eventually they they slump over, and it is um, you know it's it's a tight window in there. Narcan can work, but it, it can only work for so much time. You know, Narcan or um, opioids would act quickly, and and they can um, really depress the the body into into death very quickly. So it's it's a matter of recognizing those signs and not just assuming that somebody's passed out drunk. Um, yeah. I do recommend uh, checking out the resource slide through the Department of uh, Healthcare Services for the state of California because they do have the most thorough program and they offer institutional um, Narcan for, for facilities such as yours so that you can have a standing order and keep that supply on hand. You can also train others to share it. So, Thank you. One, what one other follow-up follow to what uh, Dean was saying is that um, uh, two things. One, Narcan is also called naloxone. So you may hear naloxone mm -hmm. and Narcan. Um, and that the naloxone will reverse the, um, well, will impede the effect of the um, opioid, but it doesn't, um, it wears off. So if someone, mm -hmm. if you administer uh, naloxone or Narcan, they still need to be taken to a hospital and, um, and uh, evaluated by a medical professional because uh, if it does wear off, they will go back into um, overdose um, effects. Also, uh, as Dean has said, um, since it does block the um, reception of the opioid, um, they start to experience withdrawal symptoms immediately. And so there are um, aspects where the person may become um, combative or, um, oh, yeah. you know, just disoriented, et cetera. So just be mindful of that, that when you administer, when you identify someone who's experiencing an overdose event and you administer Narcan, be sure to be, to have 911 immediately called so that they can respond and the, and the professionals can come in. Um, it, obviously, if someone recovers and um, they're like, I'm out of here, um, you know, uh, just note where they're, they walked and, and this description of them. Uh, don't try to restrain them. Don't try to do anything like that. Um, but they're uh, most likely, if you can get um, 911 medical responders there, as soon as you identify the overdose event and then administer the Narcan, the system will will work to support them in, in getting them to a trained medical professional. And I will leave you with um, with one final add on to what David just said. Um, there, there's no need to worry about any liability or culpability. The Good Samaritan law prevents anyone from being held accountable for uh, for the overdose, and that includes anyone. I mean, even if it's someone who is using drugs with the person, they will not be arrested on drug charges. Um, they'll be credited with saving a life. So, you know, and you're not, um, 
you know, you're not held responsible. The police show up in a very, the um, paramedics show up from what I understand in a very compassionate way. They will ask a person questions, but they, they don't ask, are you a part of this? Are you doing drugs too? Or anything like that. So no one need to ever worry about that. It is important to save a life wherever possible. So, I, I just put yeah. two flyers in the chat. Ignore the first two that I put in because they're wrong. <laughs> the most recent ones that I put in are fentanyl flyers that I shared with you uh, last year. Um, and they might be useful because it, it captures some of the graphic information, like not graphic, scare graphic, but graphic of size of fentanyl that can cause death. That might be useful for your congregants. I also have these in a printed version. Uh, and so if you would prefer them printed, let me know and I can make them available to you. They do print if you want to print them yourself in black and white or color, they print on legal size paper. And please consider anytime you have a, um, you know, an event, any kind of a resource there, any kind of a food bank, uh, stick, you know, print the flyers, stick them in the grocery sack. It doesn't mean that you're insinuating that these people might use drugs. You're not doing anything more than just getting information out there that needs to get out there. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Wow. So All that's right. so helpful and it's heavy. It's a heavy topic, but thank you for addressing it so well, everybody and your input and your questions. Thank you for being patient. I know we went over time, but this is super- No worries, important. I'm sorry, I made you go over time. <laughs> no, 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 it's good. It's all good. And I just right. wanted to mention two things. One, if you, there's a lot of great resources in the chat room, you just click on those three dots and click save chat and all those links will be saved to your computer. And then you can go click on those. Mm -hmm. And that's the quickest way to get all that information. And then I also just got a text from an update on Pastor Jeff. And it said that the second round of chemo is hitting him harder. He preached on Sunday and thought he made, he had a plan to have lunch today with two of his friends, but woke up this morning, not feeling well and had to cancel. So that's probably why he's not here as well. So um, just please do keep Pastor Jeff in mind as he battles this pancreatic cancer. So appreciate um, that. He's been a member of the community. I think he's been at the First Baptist Church of Lemon Grove for like over 30 years and, and been a big supporter of all the events in our city. So um, a dear friend. Well, let's, um, unless there's any burning announcements, let's go ahead and close. I'll just say a quick prayer. Lord, we just thank you for all the information and all the wonderful people on this call. Um, we want to make Lemon Grove a safer, better, flourishing, thriving place. So help us to do that. And we do lift up our brother Jeff to you as he battles cancer. And we give all this to you and pray that you'll bring us back together safely next month and one day in person. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you to you all. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dean. We're going to miss you. Have, uh, have a great I time. Know. Thank and you. Miss you. Hollywood. <laughs> all the best well, to you and your move. Yeah, uh, I really, I'm very excited, but it's starting to set in what I've taken on. It's like, Wow. First it was, yay, I'm moving to LA. And it's like, oh my God, I'm moving to LA. Um, you know, <laughs> exactly. there's all, this, all the logistics and such to do. So, yeah. Who did you say but, your replacement yeah. is? You have, you, um, for the time being, it will be Kate Santolina. She'll be doing some of the presentations and working with the program. And then we are, at which David um, I didn't announce, but ITS is hiring. We have three open positions in San Diego. And for anyone in the prevention, interested in working in the prevention system, um, this is a terrific time to join us. Uh, I can't say enough. I absolutely love what we do and how we do it. I did put it in the chat. I did put the link, uh, the announcement, ah. and also link to all the open positions in the chat. So very good. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Great. Good stuff. Okay. Thanks, okay, everyone. Have a great I'll check in from day. time to time. Oh, you know? yeah. Please okay. do. Please do. I will. Okay. Thank okay. you, everyone. Right. Be blessed. Take care Bye. of everyone. Bye-bye.